And welcome back to another episode of Living with FASD, an information on human interest show for those affected by prenatal exposure to alcohol, their families and loved ones, and anyone else interested in learning more about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. I'm Patty Casper, your host and your FASD coach. And today I want to welcome Kelly Rain Collin, who is the founder and director of Healthy Minds Consulting. Her academic background encompasses degrees in child development, child mental health, psychology, and education with a specialization in risk and prevention. She has worked with high-risk or at-promise children and youth for over 30 years, and she has a specialty focus on child mental health, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, and advocating for students with disabilities. And if you, you know, I, I know as a show, we're geared more towards the adults living with FASD, but you know what? We parent too. And I've yet to meet a parent that says, oh, IEPs, such a good time to chill. Yeah, no, we don't do that. <laughs> and those of us who are parenting, probably experience a little more anxiety around IEPs if we have FASD because we're so used to getting judged. So Kelly, her jam is IEPs. So Kelly, thank you for coming on. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, welcome to you to living with FASD. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. So what um, what got you interested in um, supporting people with this particular, I mean, your niche is, is pretty specific. What got you so interested in this type of support? That's kind of a long circuitous route. So we'll see how well I can. <laughs> find... oh, we got a while. <laughs> um, it wasn't a like, hey, this is what I want to do when I grow up type thing so much as you know, kind of falling into it in a, in a really nice way. Um, I have was doing educational advocacy um, already and supporting families um, with navigating the special education system, understanding their rights and the laws and how to make informed decisions for their mm -hmm. children in the IEP meetings. And um, along the way, I I'd had some information about um, FASD, but you know, back in the day, it was mostly focused on FAS and we didn't have all of the information about central nervous system challenges and all that yet. Um, and Valerie Lippo reached out to me on LinkedIn um, mm -hmm. and found me and we connected there and started talking more. And um, it was something I was interested in, but didn't have a ton of knowledge on yet. And so I got connected with the FASD Network of Southern California as they were just kind of growing and developing, yeah. um, starting to become their own nonprofit, um, ended up being on one of the founding board members um, for that group for the first six years or so they were in existence. Yeah, that's how you and I connected about okay. two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So there, um, so I got more connected with the community that way. And then um, they would do a lot of trainings and support groups and things like that. And so I was able to bring in IEP trainings to the support groups. And I sat in the support groups and I listened to families and I learned a lot um, from the experience, direct experiences of the families as well. And then did research and took trainings and, you know, tried to really dive in as much as I could because I realized this is a population that was so underserved and so yeah. misunderstood much of the time. Yeah. And I think that's <clears throat> some of, um, I haven't had a whole lot of IEP experience. I, you know, I'm thinking back to my 24 years in foster care and adoptions. Um, and when I was the first time I worked within the foster care sphere, I didn't know anything about FASD totally clueless. Um, and then I was in adoptions for probably the next 17 years or so. 
And so I went to a few IEP meetings in the context of post-adoption support. And by the time I went to those, I clearly knew about FASD. And I have a cat that may come on camera any moment. Yep, there he is. <laughs> Hi, Henry. Um, anyway, but I, when I would pipe up and say things, yeah, it was like a, I, the ideas floated about as well as a lead balloon. I mean, it's just my my comments, my questions just went nowhere. I think one of the biggest challenges that I see in the IEP process and and with Nat with advocating um, kids in that through that process is that FASD has um, you know there's there are the neurodevelopmental approaches, neurobehavioral approaches, if you will that that are really effective and looking at the brain-based needs and really mm -hmm. from it, from that approach can be really effective um, for the students, but that is outside of the typical perspective yeah. of most school professionals. It's not yeah. something trained in, it's not something they're most are aware of yet, even though it's yeah. becoming more mainstream knowledge with Mona de la Hook and others out there talking about, you know, these yeah. brain, um, ways of addressing behaviors and parents mm -hmm. like that. There's yeah, she's she's probably a little well known or more well known than um, oh even even Karen Purvis who's in the trauma sphere, but you know more than um, Diane Malbin. Mm -hmm. You know people are like who? Yeah, <laughs> like, it's only the Bible for those of us with FASD, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's so beneficial because it really, you know, lays out the neurobehavioral model. Yeah. And um, and it's great for so many people. It's not, while it's designed, you know, specifically for FASD, it applies to so many neurodevelopmental yeah. populations. Um, yeah. Because I, I use it with my mom who's got Lewy body dementia. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was reading it and just thought, oh, this is good parenting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It really is. It really is. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the challenges with the IEPs, right? Is that the schools don't necessarily come at it from that perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And most of the behavioral interventions that are ingrained in schools have a behavior modification focus. Yeah. It's all compliance driven. Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. Such a huge paradigm shift. Yeah for so many educators. So is there something that you do to start leading other IEP uh, participants toward taking that paradigm shift? I think the thing that's most helpful is really talking about the brain-based nature of the disability, right? And bringing, mm -hmm. bringing it back to the fact that the brain is a physical organ of the body and it's a physical mm -hmm. disability. And I don't think we think about the brain that way most of the time. Yeah. Um, we think about brain-based stuff as it's not a physical disability, but it, yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that there was such a stigma on counseling or anything else having to do with mental health or mental illness. And, you know, I've always felt like, well, it's no different than my pancreas. Right. <laughs> you know? The dogs in the background, we got a delivery and they're very excited about it. So I don't <laughs> you... hear them. I don't oh, hear them. <laughs> <laughs> they're loud to me. So I'm glad. I'm glad they're not. Yeah, it, it, you know, it really is um, an important piece to to focus in on that it's a physical mm -hmm. because we, once we picture it that way, then it's easier for people to think about how do we address physical disabilities in an educational yeah. setting? We do accommodations. Yeah. We to change the physical part of the child we right. just accommodate their needs right. um, and so when we're able to think that way and start to make that shift that can be helpful it's not mm -hmm. an immediate oh okay great we'll do that now <laughs> you know response yeah. but yeah. starts to you know shift that paradigm just to, to kind of work on approaching it from a new angle mm-hmm is there any particular um, 
phrase that you use to get people to, you know, crack their minds a little bit open to, you know, considering a different paradigm? I don't know if I have a specific phrase um, that targets that um, so much as the brain-based disability and really yeah. bringing it back to that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are some terms um, that we use in IEPs that are helpful um, with bringing it back to that as well. So talking about the behaviors as a manifestation of the disability, mm. um, a special phrasing that can be really helpful because yeah. those words that are in, written into the laws with regard to how to address behaviors that are problematic and okay. so set that up ahead of time and talk about that in the IEP meetings and ideally get it written into the IEP that mm -hmm. specific behaviors are a manifestation of the child's disability, that they are connected, that it's not okay. just being a brat. Yeah. <laughs> right? That it's really part of the disability, then that's helpful because it's then written into the document and yeah. helps describe for anybody who reads it that this is part of the disability. Mm -hmm. So when it rises, it's already known as a right. Person. Much right. Better. So Kelly, what are some of the struggles that um, parents bring up most often when they work with you? Some of it would be uh, trying to address the, the behaviors, I think, and, and figuring out how to do that effectively through the IEP process. And again, with, with the challenge of that paradigm shift, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are specific processes in the laws like functional behavior assessments or analyses and behavior intervention plans and things like that that are written into the IEP laws that are all currently behavior modification focused. Mm -hmm. And so when the schools utilize those, if they don't have that paradigm shift, then the focus ends up being very surface level. So yeah, they do an analysis and find out that the child's trying to get attention mm -hmm. or to the task but there's not the deeper level look at why are they trying to get your attention? Right. And, and there doesn't seem to be any understanding of trauma at all. There's a, a movement towards that in most education programs these days. Um, it's slow going to get mm -hmm. you know, dispersed, I think, among all educators, but many are learning more about trauma-informed mm -hmm. care informed practices, which I think will be really beneficial to the FASD population as well. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I certainly think that there's absolutely zero recognition of the trauma caused by people who assume behavior is always chosen. I think that's right? a great point. It's, it's, it's like microaggressions, right? It, mm -hmm. It's additional tiny, you know, little traumas. Yeah happen over and over and over yeah. without people realizing it without people intending um harm and yet yeah. hers and so that gets internalized right for, you know, right well when when we get blamed shamed and punished for quote unquote behavior mm -hmm. um assumed to be chosen that is is simply protective yeah right and, and, then, and there's never the consideration of, well, what are we trying to protect ourselves against? I think that going that to that deeper level is what I encourage schools mm -hmm. to really do um, because, you know, typical in-school discipline type programs and behavior charts and things like mm -hmm. that, especially if they're classroom wide behavior charts can be really shaming yeah. if a student isn't able to you know, do what's expected despite their best efforts. Yeah. Yeah. Let alone something like inconsistent performance, you know, on days and off days, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, that, and, and to be fair, that is really confusing to most adults. <laughs> so well, what do you mean? You could do it yesterday. You did it last week. What do you mean? You can't, you don't know it or you can't do it. Um, it is very confounding, right? To, to be fair, but it's part of the disability. Right. And it's such an essential part to be addressed in the IEP process because mm -hmm. um, noting that kids will have the on days and the off days or the on hours or on minutes yeah. and hours yeah. and minutes 
that sometimes that brain's going to be firing and everything's connecting, you know, ideally. And other times it's just misfiring. It's not really connecting in the yeah. way that effective for this particular task yeah. that they're working on and acknowledging that and having grace around that can be mm. really, really helpful. And so that's, that's so important right there. Having grace, right. Offering grace to your students, you know, and because people have been saying things like, well, kids will do well if they can, or, um, you know, no one's, no one ever is intending to be disruptive. Um, I mean, we've been saying things like that. We've been recognizing things like that for years, mm -hmm. but it just never seems to make it <laughs> onto <laughs> paper. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to shift those ingrained ways yeah. of doing things, especially when they're systems wide. Mm -hmm. Individuals, you know, are are more able to shift those kind of paradigms once they shift the, the mindset, are able to shift behaviors as well. Mm -hmm. However, if you're sitting inside of a system that hasn't shifted and you have to yeah. work in that system and its regulations, it becomes more and more difficult. There's just a, a lot mm -hmm. more barriers and challenges it doesn't mean yeah. it can't happen by any means and that's you know keep trying to promote it trying to work on that but it definitely you know from a systems perspective can be really challenging yeah now I know where I don't know how widespread this is but I know in the in the county where I live there are a few schools specifically for behavior problem kids right um and I shudder any time a child is brought up in discussion to go there because I know their behavior is just about to get a thousand times worse. And I know that in at least two of those schools, restraint is a daily occurrence for our kids with FASD. Yeah. Oftentimes, it, it, I've had, I've had uh, the children of some of my clients do, when I was doing post-adoption support who were restrained by four people. And um, I, I have a hard time with that. <laughs> I have a really hard time with that. Um how how often does that come up in your work and what are the avenues that that you communicate to say we got to do something different it comes up a lot and um and part of the challenge is that when the kids needs aren't effectively addressed early on then things get more and more challenging along the way and kind of like the microaggression type, you know, multiple mini mm -hmm. traumas that we talked about earlier, how that adds up, right? If you are constantly frustrated in school because your needs are not getting met um, and you don't feel supported and you don't yeah. feel belong, uh, then, you know, there's so much around that, that, that just increases all of the challenges, increases yeah. um, self-doubt, um, and reduces self-confidence, um, yeah. as well as, you know, increases anxiety and all of the challenges around trying to be effective at school. Yeah. And I see it frequently that, you know, definitely restraints are something that have been ingrained in the schools in the past. There is a big movement to reduce or eliminate restraints. Mm -hmm. So that's a positive thing. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the more we can get the neurobehavioral model and brain-based approaches mm -hmm. into the mainstream um, understanding of educational professionals, the easier it will be to, to reduce restraints. Yeah. Um, and, um, because the interventions will be more effective for any and all neurodivergent individuals, including mm -hmm. Steve. So um, you've mentioned the name of a particular model several times, <laughs> the neurobehavioral model. Are you one of the certified facilitators of FACET's neurobehavioral model? I'm just curious. 
I am not. I've taken some of the training. I took, um, I think it was the last training that Diane Malbin did herself. Um, yeah. Was to be able to to attend that and learn from her as mm -hmm. well as others um, and have um, read up on it. Um, mm -hmm. and currently reading uh, Nate Sheets' book. Excellent um, book. ISD support. Yeah. Really yeah. great um, and really helpful strategies as well. Yeah. Um, and just constantly learning and taking more trainings and learning from those who live this every yeah. day um, with their families. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Diane, I, I've met Diane, well, sort of, kind of, I met her in a Zoom room, <laughs> um, close to the end of my year long training with FACET. So um, I did get that certification. Um, right. Nate's book is full of very specific um, examples of interventions, right? Essential interventions, right? I think is what it's called or essential supports. Yeah. Um, do you find that the way he phrases things are schools receptive to? I think he does a great job at presenting things in a way that schools may be more receptive to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just reading the book this year. So it just came out in May, I believe. So yeah, haven't had, you know, a lot of opportunity to go into IEPs with his language specifically. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is aligned with what mm -hmm. I was doing previously. And so yeah. it's helped, have, you know, certain nuances and phrases and things like that, that he has found very effective to mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I think his approaches are excellent. And, and the more we can get the schools on board with, you know, that understanding and those approaches, it'll be helpful. Yeah. Now uh, there's another, um, struggle that I have seen several times, you know, over and over again in, in where I reside, which shall be nameless. <laughs> um, it seems to me, and, and I don't know how widespread this is, but it seems to me that some of the providers who are contracted to do the assessments for the school districts um, have certain biases shall we say? Um, and I think at the very least, there's a lack of knowledge around FASD, right? An assumption of, oh, they don't have the face, that's not it, right? Or not understanding that it is a physical disability with intellectual, you know, behavioral um, and every <laughs> social implications. Um, that, that are, as we've been saying, a direct challenge to the behavioral model, right? That all behavior is chosen. Um, but because children are able to work so very hard during the school day to pull it all together and to wear the mask, you know, they don't completely run out of juice, you know, for their cognitive battery pack. <laughs> they don't completely run out and fritz out and spaz out and tantrum until they get home. And so the behaviors that parents are reporting and asking about are not seen at the school. And I know of several instances where the parents are labeled by the school psychologists or the, by the psychologists hired by the schools um, as having factitious disorder, right? Mm -hmm. Which we used to call Munchausen's or Munchausen's by proxy. You know, you're just trying to get attention. Um, you know, you're, you're, your kid's a bad kid, but the rest of it you're making up, right? Um, do you see that widespread or do you see that changing? I don't know as I see it widespread as far as the labeling, but but definitely the challenge around um, kids going home and then having that release and being in a place where they feel safe enough mm -hmm. to let go. That's yeah. common with um, with many different kiddos, um, FASD included. And I think part of the challenge with um, the school assessments is that, you know, as you mentioned, they're just not FASD informed. They just don't mm -hmm. know. And so that's part of the mission of so many groups. FASD now is yeah. working with 
in California, you know, an alliance of a lot of individuals and organizations working together and many other states have organizations working hard on that as well. Mm -hmm. um, FASD United and the Respect Act, trying to get movement with regard yeah. to information and education throughout the states so that it isn't such an invisible disability, so that it's not hidden, so that yeah. there's more awareness. And um, as school psychologists get to know more about FASD and really understand what they've been missing, right? Because mm -hmm. I think these things where, you know, many um, people that I've talked to feel like they know about it hmm. and yet are missing the majority of the, the current information because yeah. what they have is what was, you know, previously taught to us 20 plus years ago. Right. Um, right. And so as, as, or it's what they come up with on, on the internet searches, the search engines that can throw out a lot of statistics without any of the context right? Yeah. Without the information about the study itself, you know, for, that, that clues you in on, you know, do I take this with a grain of salt <laughs> or is it gospel? And I think there's, you know, more efforts too, to get um, solid FASD knowledge out there, FASD collaborative. So working hard on that. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. know I myself and the Healthy Minds have been working hard on that, um, embracing the brain. There's a lot of groups that are really work mm -hmm. to I know you are <laughs> um you yeah. know podcasts and other um works are really trying to get the word out and trying to share knowledge yeah. and share the everyday struggles challenges um you know yeah fabulous parts of you know <laughs> living with FASD all of the above right the the whole gamut and the more we get that information out there the more we can share the more we can educate mm -hmm. um educators, school psychologists, anybody who's doing assessments, OTs, um, PTs, speech yeah. and language therapists, everybody, the more likely we are to really get effective evaluations for our students. Yeah. So I know one of the um, services that many of us need is um, along the lines of sensory processing. So many of us have hyper or hyposensitivity to various inputs, um, or even our internal senses, like, you know, proprioception, or, you know, what our body is doing in space, right? Or interoception, like, are we hungry? Are we, um, are we tired? Are we cold, right? All those things can be off. Um, or vestibular, I mean, we just need either more more stimulation or we need to avoid it um and ot is the only service that provides those interventions typically uh, that in the school system that would be through an occupational therapist yeah mm -hmm. yeah but a lot of times or at least you know there again i can only judge based on the county where i reside um, the county is very limited or in, within the school system, there are pretty, there's, there's so many limitations, you know, you can only get such a very small amount, you know, these might be all the needs, but we can only provide 10% of that service. Um, you know, what, what are, what are you coming up against in it with that regard? Yeah, that's a challenging one um, because you know the way the laws are set up, finances and financial considerations should not be part of the decision of what the child needs in that mm -hmm. evening. Um, and yet, it's one of the things schools have to deal with, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fact of life for them. Um, and so it can be a challenging situation. Um, and you know the IEPs really have to focus on what are the needs of this child and how can we meet that. Mm -hmm. And so I really try to come to the IEP table with a collaborative approach that says, how, how can we figure this out together? How can we as a team, mm -hmm. you know, look at this differently, think outside the box and figure out how to meet this child's needs? Um, maybe it doesn't need this huge expense. Maybe we can do it differently, you know. Mm -hmm. 
by looking at things from a new angle. Okay. Um, sometimes there are expenses. That's yeah. part of how it goes. But, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, really trying to find collaborative ways to work together and come up with creative solutions. Yeah. I know I'm I'm working with a family now that has a three year old who's you know transitioning from search and serve over to the school district um, you know services for mm -hmm. early intervention and you know I, I he really needs a good assessment but this little kid I mean bless his heart he has no breaks. <laughs> He just keeps running until a wall or a piece of furniture stops him. And it's just like bruise after bruise after bruise. And, you know, he's got his today, in fact, is the big meeting with the school. And I'm like, ugh, I wish I had the language, you know, or the opportunity to have that conversation with them, mm -hmm. you know. And there are quite a few things that families can do during that transition period to set up the IEP process, um, mm -hmm. set up the IEP document effectively. Um, I think, you know, if the families are comfortable disclosing FASD, I think that's a really important piece is yeah. being able to acknowledge that because once that is documented, then it sets up um, a part of the law called child find, which is basically acknowledging that this child has a disability and a specific disability and it puts the school district on notice that hey this is the child's specific needs and then the school's ob obligation is to then assess for those needs yeah. and so I think that's one of the areas that we're really trying to promote I know through FASD now and doing trainings to educators is helping them understand what does that mean to uh, to assess for FASD? Here's my normal battery that I would typically do, you know, make adjustments depending on the child's needs. But there are there tend to be some go to dot, um, assessments that mm -hmm. that are used in each school district. A lot of that's because of, that's what they've purchased or that's what's available. That's what the school psychologist is familiar with. There might be a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and within that, they decide which ones are appropriate for that child. But without a deep understanding of FASD and the many nuances that go yeah. along with that, they may miss a number of areas that really yeah. should be assessed. And yeah. so when the family is able to document that and really talk about all the nuanced challenges that their child is facing, the more it helps the school psychologist to be able to understand and the other assessors OT, speech, PT, you know, whoever else is assessing there um, to really look at, oh, okay, these are some of the needs that we need to address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, you know, I'm, I'm once again in the foster care end of things. And um, so, I mean, it, it's well known at this point that up to 70% of kids in care have been prenatally exposed, have, you know, are somewhere on the spectrum, even if they're not yet diagnosed. And, you know, I've got a lot of kids whose mothers confirmed other drugs because they had to, right? It, they, the kids were tested positive for various substances at the time of their birth. Um, but, you know, as is so commonly um, absent is the confirmation of alcohol exposure um, because what mother wants to add on that added shame and stigma of a drug that's legal, you know, just, just confirm what they have to and let the rest go. And I certainly understand that from, from a mother's perspective, it, it's tough to swallow, you know, regardless of the fact that probably the bulk of exposure was before you even knew you were pregnant. So um, it really impacts the ability for these kids to receive services. It can. And yet I think there are ways to still address the needs of those kids too, even if there's not disclosure. Um, that's something that um, we've been working on in developing these trainings um, for FASD now and for educators on FASD and the various components of um, the IEP is really looking at um, what if, there's 
all the red flags and all of these things that say, we really suspect FASD, but we don't have confirmation. What do you mm -hmm. do then? And one of the things that I really encourage the IEP teams to consider is how do we, what if we just looked at this as if the student was prenatally exposed? How would we mm -hmm. do things differently then? And yeah. maybe try some of those things and see if they're effective. Because yeah. again, a lot of the approaches that are effective for kids with FASD are very effective for kids with all sorts of different neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so being able to utilize those techniques can really make a difference. Yeah, I really like that. Um, and I find that valuable because part of me is just so concerned because let's face it, the school does have that bottom dollar that it has to um, has to even out at the end of the year, <laughs> right? And so there's, of course, the the temptation to weasel out of what you can in order to protect that bottom line. And I totally, you know, business wise, it totally makes sense. So I really like that approach. Let's let's put some interventions in place, acting on the as if this is there and just see how helpful it is regardless of whether a diagnosis ever falls into place. And that's the beauty of the neurobehavioral model is you can use it before there is ever a diagnosis. Definitely. Right? Yeah, yeah, because it works on how does the brain work? Well, the brain works without ever anyone going through an assessment. <laughs> right? The brain doesn't wait for assessments before it starts working. Right. 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 And okay. And then many of these approaches are still going to be very effective. Yeah. Or so likely to be. Yeah. So Kelly, what what are the services that you offer? So we offer educational consultation. Um, so one of the things that I'll do these days is, is um, parents who come to me um, with um, a student with FASD um, and are interested in kind of an overview of um, a look through their educational records, any additional records that they might have from outside service providers, and be able to pull all of that information together into a document um, with the perspective um, of an educational advocate. So looking at what I know about IEP development and what I know about the IEP process and how to set up information so that hopefully it's um, it's really a good starter package of information mm -hmm. that the family can then go back to the school with and present to the IEP team so that there's documentation of here's how these different components of the history all demonstrate red flags. Mm -hmm. Here's, um, you know, these other pieces that, you know, that have been brought in from outside providers that also um, are consistent with, you know, what was seen in kindergarten, what was seen in first grade, what was seen in mm -hmm. second grade, you know, and kind of pulling all of that information together um, that, again, might be red flags that I'm very familiar with um, that are consistent with the diagnosis of FASD or the presentation of FASD that many school professionals might not be aware of yet. Yeah. So trying to pull that all together in one comprehensive document that then can be provided to the IEP team and then also serves to be documentation for the school of what should we be looking for? How should mm -hmm. we, you know, maybe go about this? What are the additional areas we need to assess that maybe we missed before? Now that we have this information, we can go ahead and assess those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know one of the one of the challenges that comes up with the testing done of our kids on the FA, FASD spectrum is that sometimes the results come back with such a scattered field right? Um, the things that pop are just seemingly so random and scattered that a lot of times school personnel don't know what to do with that. And they may mistakenly say, well, there's nothing to see here. I think sometimes that gets mistaken for um, kind of an averaged out overview mm -hmm. instead of really looking at the scatter that's in some of the assessment profiles and acknowledging that, oh, well, they really have strengths over here and a real 
challenge mm-hmm. and weakness over here? And how do we look at those specific areas of learning and understanding and mm-hmm. processing of information and apply that to what's happening in the classroom? Mm-hmm. And also keeping in mind that most assessments are done in a small, quiet area that is typically one-on-one. It doesn't have the classroom environment around it. And so sometimes kids test a lot better in those situations than they demonstrate in the classroom. And other kids just really don't do well in testing situations. And so the testing is not as good, but in some classroom situations, they do better. So it's yeah. really, you know, it can be helpful to get some information I found um, about the child's cognitive processing mm-hmm. and the way they think about things and, you know, where, what things are effective and what are not in order to try to tailor some of the educational interventions. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, with FASD, you know, they could be having an on day, off day, on in yeah. one test, off in another. So there's going to be a lot of variability there as well. Okay. And so you serve clients where are are you, do you have specific locales or do you, because of, you know, Zoom, like what I'm using now, are your, are your clients everywhere? Anywhere in the U.S. and, and U.S. territories, any okay. it's covered by an IEP. Um, so I can do the FASD consultation um, there. I do have um, more specific knowledge of California laws Um, but the general educational, um, kind of consultation and report piece, um, that can be based on the federal laws and can go anywhere. Okay. I also have another piece too, that, that might be helpful for some of your viewers is, um, we, I run, um, a group monthly called the FASD and the IEP mentorship coalition. Wonderful work with anybody who um, attends IEPs um, and who has some basic knowledge of IEPs and FASD is welcome. And we kind of deep dive into different aspects of the IEP and how it applies to students with FASD. Sometimes we'll do case studies. Um, Sometimes we've had guest speakers come in. Um, Again, Nate Sheets recently talked about functional behavior analyses and behavior intervention plans. We've had attorneys come in and talk about um, the, that, the due process um, challenges mm-hmm. with kids with FASD. Um, mm-hmm. Janice Reed spoke on um, looking at adapting um, therapeutic interventions, mm-hmm. like counseling interventions and how mm-hmm. to find ones that are effective. So we try yeah. to pull in a different aspects of the IEP. Um, okay. Design. Wonderful. So if someone wanted information to join that, um, I, in the show notes, I, I'm putting all your links. So your okay. website, your Twitter handle, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, for both your company and your um, personal page. Those are all in the show notes. So which one of those should someone that wants to come to one of those meetings find you at? Um, it's on the web page. And I can make sure you have the direct link as well um, okay. to that group. But FASD and the IEP Mentorship Coalition is one of the tabs on the webpage. Okay. Um, searching for it. And okay. uh, a helpful way to kind of do continuing education for yeah. those interested. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, okay. So is there any any anything else that you want our listeners or viewers to um to take away from them today. I think one of the things we touched on earlier that I wanted to um, talk a little bit more about was the challenges with um, how parents are viewed um, sometimes. And I think that comes back to the assessment process as well, because there are often checklists um, Mm -hmm. that have to do with ADHD and autism type behaviors and things like that, that parents fill out. And part of the checklist is a component that tells the assessor whether or not this person is likely just exaggerating information. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with kids with FASD, an honest feedback will end up with those scores that that look like the information is really exaggerated. And so for assessors to realize that that actually may be very valid information and the behaviors and challenges that this student is experiencing are really that severe. 
And okay. so really keep that in mind and not dismiss that information. So it's important for parents to know that so that they can say, hey, yes, but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. And be able to to note and talk with the assessor about it. Hey, I understand this might look extreme. Mm -hmm. These are part of the challenges and these are all things that are related to my child's disability. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's really good language to use as well. Um, I am so glad that you, Kelly, that you came on um, to talk about all this. Now you have some upcoming events, don't you? We um, are going to be in California um, and are looking to do some trainings in California during the month of March. Mm -hmm. um, so once we get those scheduled, um, feel free to check the website and we'll have information about that. Or you can reach out to me directly if you're interested in trainings throughout California during the month of March. We can okay. set that up. So you have you have a couple already scheduled, like aren't you going to be in San Diego and yes. up in San Francisco um, yes, thank you. at conferences? At conferences, yes. Um, I am presenting, co-presenting with Shannon Yakabachi. Um, oh, at, she's wonderful uh, too. She's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, in San Diego, um, I believe it's March 7th at um, okay. Cal ESCE, which is an early childhood special education symposium. Um, okay. It's down there looking at FASD, um, the early years. Mm -hmm. And then we are presenting um, towards the end of the month up at Oakland for the first five symposium and that's okay. looking at how brain-based behaviors um and brain-based behavioral approaches can support child mental health yeah oh those are going to be fabulous and Thank i'm you. so thrilled at the work that you're doing in those communities and and hopefully all the communities <laughs> in between so, so <laughs> i know i'm 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 hoping that i can get you in somewhere here in the bakersfield area um but so, all right. So like I said, everybody, if you want to reach out to Kelly, if you, if she can be of assistance to you uh, with your children, um, you know, her website, her Twitter handle, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of those things are going to be in the show notes. Um, so if you want to invite her to come, you know, I, I'm assuming by Zoom or whatever, to do a presentation with your school, Kelly, is that something you would be open to doing? Yeah, if it's outside awesome. of California or not during March when I happen to be <laughs> touring uh -huh. California, um, I could definitely do Zoom um, yeah. trainings and, and consultations as well. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, <clears throat> and then also, you know, as I indicated at the beginning of the hour, everyone, I am a certified facilitator of the neurobehavioral model. So I can do those specific trainings. It's a, there's a, the full training is 18 hours. Um, and so I can do that as well. And, and there are links in the show notes also as to how you can um, reach out to me, um, you know, for your agency or your community or also for coaching. Um, I work with parents of kiddos with FASD, but I also work with neurodevelopment or neurobehavioral, neurodevelopmental um, adults who may be through listening to the podcast or th from reading Sip by Sip, which is my book, um, you know, maybe you've just realized, wow, maybe my struggles in life are tied to my parents' um, consumption of alcohol, right? Um, before they knew that I was there, um, you know, and just figuring out that your struggles are, are not your fault. Um, I can help you methodically explore those struggles, also your strengths, your learning preferences, and come up with some accommodations so that life runs a little more smoothly. Um, you know, and that Kelly, that just triggered a thought for mm -hmm. a few of my clients um, who have kiddos. I have written letters for them to provide to their schools um, based on just presenting the findings from FACET's exploration tool which lists the nine domains of primary characteristics, right? And um, each example, and it's not an exhaustive list by far, but it is like the most frequently or common symptoms 
behavioral characteristics within each category. Um, you know, and, and the letter will spell out, you know, with regard to language and communication, my child uh, sometimes will do this or usually does that or often struggles with blah, blah, blah. Um, and I and I do that for all of those categories. And I've had schools provide the feedback to the parents. Oh, well, we don't know that model, so we're not even going to look at it. Um, is there something about the way that you convey the information that gets them to look at it as valid? Because our it's parents right. have yeah. the most <laughs> valuable information of all. Right. And that's huge. And yeah. um, I, I do have a template that I use with families that I can also give you the direct link to that. Um, that for writing a letter to the school as far as an initial IEP request for their student with FASD. And so it will have a number of examples in there, but I also mm -hmm. leave it open so that families can list the, the um, behaviors and symptoms and, and challenges that their individual child has, because it is mm -hmm. so different, right? Every yeah. individual is different. Yeah, we're um, all unique. <laughs> right. And it's set up in a way that is both geared to provide the school with information mm -hmm. and to set up documentation if the family, for whatever reason, needs to go to due process later and needs to be able to follow up on their, their parental rights, mm -hmm. that they also have some documentation set up for that. Yeah. So the idea is that it plants the seed to be able to then talk about the brain-based disability and the yeah. neurobehavioral type models and what's effective for that population. Yeah. So it's a starter seed. Um, it doesn't necessarily, you know, solve everything right up, you know, from the mm -hmm. beginning, but I think it starts the process. So then starts a, the conversation about yeah. how to address this disability effectively. Yeah. Because I, I think so oftentimes parents um, walk through the parking lot back to their car, feeling as though um, they've been discounted, right? As just a parent, right? And that their valuable feedback is just, you know, invisible. And, and for those of us with FASD who are already accustomed to feeling judged or dismissed, you know, it, it seems to me that that's even further amplified. Very likely. And you reminded me too, I actually have a, a survey out. If anybody's interested in participating in that, I can give you that link as well. That Looking would be great. At the emotional impact of IEP meetings for mm -hmm. school professionals, as well as for families, anybody who sits at the IEP table, what is it like? What does it feel yeah. like before? What does it feel like during? What does it feel like after? What do you think could be improved? Yeah. Um, and looking at kind of those aspects, because you're right, a lot of the feedback that I get is this high anxiety, this frustration, mm -hmm. this, um, you know, just so much stress around yeah. it. And some of that comes from the school professionals are feeling stressed too, for many reasons. So yeah. the more we can find ways to effectively collaborate and find that common ground, I think will be helpful. And so that's kind of what the survey is geared towards is yeah. gathering information and then being able to look at the results and say like, how do we actually get the school's perspective and the family's perspectives more on an even ground where we can all feel like we're making effective progress in these meetings. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, it seems to me that the educators are um, not alone, right? Every field I think struggles with busyness and time constraints and the preference for things to be cookie cutter, because that can get processed more quickly. And, um, you know, best practice is really what we're shooting for with an IEP, just like it is with, you know, a treatment plan meeting or, um, you know, a child family uh, meeting with the, you know, social services. Um, you know, best practice is at the heart of it. But the reality is that there's such a push for time 
that it seems like, yeah, the practice might be there, but the best is often left out. I think we also, in, in almost every field, it's easy to get stuck in, this is how we do things. Yeah. And so it's sometimes it's, we get into that rut without even realizing that we're there. Yeah. Um, and I think that happens with IEP meetings too. It's like, okay, this is how we do things. This is the way we do it. This is how our approach. Yeah. And sometimes we have to try to find a way to stop and yeah. say, okay, but that's not effective for this child. Yeah. Let's this focus on Johnny. Different, right? And so <laughs> how can we shift out of that? Yeah. Understand this is how you're used to doing things. Unfortunately, yeah. it's not working for this child. Yeah. How can we do something different? What might be effective? Yeah. What do you think, you know, from, from your perspective and bring you back, you know, so that it's a dialogue and so that there's really communication around, you know, mm -hmm. what can we do as a team? Yeah. Oh, well, again, you have brought so much valuable feedback to everybody this week. I'm so glad you were able to join me on living with FASD. Um, everybody, please, please, please find Kelly's links for whatever she can help you with. It's in the show notes. Um, if you want to become part of the um, living with FASD podcast community, go over to Facebook and the groups tab and just look up living with FASD podcast. You'll find us there. Um, and again, if you need either one of us for trainings, whether it's IEP specific or neurobehavioral model specific, um, you know, find, find that information in the show notes. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time on Living with FASD.